Okay, thanks, Bruce. Can uh, can you hear me? Okay. We can. Wow, modern technology. Um, let me blur my background here so it doesn't distract. Um, I've got a few uh, PowerPoint slides, and I won't bore you with too many. Um, and uh, and and I'm going to talk about two different things. One is uh, just kind of an introduction to QSO parties and what they are and why they exist. Uh, and second is uh, be a little bit more specific about the New England QSO party, which uh, turns out this is its 22nd year. Um, and uh, it's been, as Bruce says, I, I'm pleased with how successful it has become. So let me start by sharing the screen here. And can you see that okay? Yeah, we can see it. Okay, good. Uh, so let's start with what is a QSO party? Um, when I first became a ham, and uh, that was Ooh, 1964. Um, I don't believe there. Are, I was aware of any QSO parties. Um, there might have been a couple, but um, um, as a as a newcomer, um, basically the only contests were that were around were a handful of them run by the ARL. Uh, there was a CQ Worldwide DX contest. And maybe in field day and maybe a couple of others, but there were not very many. Um, over time, a whole category of contests has started up called QSO parties. And it's an on the air operating event. Um, most of them are on the HF bands 80 to 10 meters without 18 and 24 and 30 meters. Um, Mostly it's CW and sideband, but in many of them, digital modes are increasing. And then there's a whole slew of QSO events involving the digital modes that are not scored the same way QSO parties are. Um, activities for QSO parties are normally between 12 and 24 hours long. Um, and some of them have overnight breaks uh, and, and just uh, just happen, dur happen during daylight hours. But they're all a little bit different, um, and which is kind of kind of fun because they are different. Um, there's sometimes there's more emphasis on um, on CW, sometimes there's more emphasis on low bends than high bends, but you know they, they do vary quite a bit. And it's if you're serious about them, you will look at the rules and, uh, and and make sure you understand them before jumping in. But that's not at all required. Um, the, the goal is to stimulate on the air activity in a specific geographic area. So New England QSO party, geographic area, six states in New England. Um, there are actually a couple of QSO parties in New England for specific states, uh, Vermont, New Hampshire, and Maine, I believe each have one. Um, when we set up the QSO part, the New England contest originally, we talked to all of the people running QSO parties in New England and basically, basically got all of them to agree to join in and help make a New England QSO party. Since then, a couple of them have gone back and uh, or new groups have come along and set up um, statewide uh, QSO parties at different different times of the year. But the basic reason for having one that covers all of New England is that you get more activity. And with more activity, uh, you get more people interested in talking to you if you're in one of those New England states. Um, the uh, the previous QSO parties might have gotten 25, 50, maybe 100 people on the air. 
uh, and people from outside of New England would uh, you know, work 25 or 30 of them or something like that, maybe more in some cases, but the activity was fairly modest. Uh, with the New England QSO party, um, for instance, we get close to a thousand New England stations on the air and uh, many more than that outside of New England. Um, so basically a QSO party is getting a particular state or area of the country on the air at the same time for a certain, you know, certain amount of time uh, on a weekend. Um, and the scoring, and, and there's two, the two things about it. One is anybody's welcome to, to join in and make contacts, talk to people in both New England and outside of New England, for example. And there's no requirement to send in a log. Um, if you do send in a log, we're forever grateful because we like to tally up who did the best um, afterwards. Um, the scoring is fairly simple. It's basically the number of QSOs you make by the total of US states, Canadian provinces, and DX countries worked. That's usually the formula for most of the QSO parties. So it's really simple. You can operate on, on six bands. Some of them include 160 meters, uh, but uh, most are just 80 through 10. Uh, you can operate CW sideband and digital modes in most of them. And uh, you work as many people as you can. The, um, uh, again, the, multi, the score is number of QSOs. In some cases, you get a preference for contacts on CW or sideband or digital modes. In some cases, not. Um, and you try, if you're in New England, you try to work as many states and Canadian provinces and countries as you can, which means you can't stick on one band if you want to do well. You have to follow the propagation uh, as it changes during the day um, and, uh, and evening. Um, and and uh, so the, the, the better your station is equipped in terms of antennas and and your knowledge of propagation, the better it is, the more likely you are to be able to do well. Uh, for the most part, the, the New England contest is focused in the last seven or eight years, mostly on 40 and 20 meters and a little bit on 80. But 15 and 10 meters have not been very good uh, up until um, you know, the last eight or 10 months. So. Most people would operate a lot on 20 meters and a lot and during the day and 40 meters in the evening. Out of state or out of region, out of New England stations, all try to work New England. So every one of the people get, that get on in New England becomes instantly popular. Um, people want to want to talk to you. They you know they they want to talk to every state and they want to talk to every county in New England. And there's 67 counties. Um, there might be 68 next year, but that's a whole different story. Um, I think there will be 68 next year. Um, but people out of, out of the area try to work New England and they try to work all the counties. Well, that's a lot of fun. You go looking for people and you find out that there's a lot of people in New England that are in, in Worcester County, in Middlesex County, uh, and in a couple of other counties in, uh, in Massachusetts, but then you never hear people in some counties like Nantucket or Martha's Vineyard, which is Dukes County, or even Boston, Suffolk County. There's not many hams that live in Boston and actually have the ability to put up a, uh, an HF antenna. So Suffolk is usually a, a tough one. And then you go to Northern New England and there's some big cities here and there, but there's a lot of empty space and there's some counties that have less than 25 hams in them. Uh, tough ones in Maine, New Hampshire, and Vermont in particular. Um, so there's a lot of activity by people that go mobile and try to cover some of those rarer counties. Our goal every year in New England is to try to get all 67 counties on the air. And the goal for somebody outside of New England is to try to find them all. Um, so in, in any case, in a QSO party, the people 
in the targeted area are very popular. So you can get on with not much of an antenna and not much power and people will find you. The, the better your station is, the more you're heard and the more people will call you. But it's, uh, it, if, you're, if, you're used, if you've ever listened to a DX station and all the people that call them, uh, sometimes during the USO party, and if you're the, in the target area, you get a feel for what it's like to have 15 or 20 or 30 people call you at once. And it's quite a rush. It's pretty interesting. It's actually hard it, the, the first time you do it, um, maybe even the second time. And you'll learn a lot about operating. You'll learn about copy and call signs. And, uh, uh, and, and basically, uh, you actually learn as the propagation changes during the day uh, at how different regions start to come in over time. So anyhow, let me go to, a, to the next slide and not spend too much there. Um, what do QSO parties accomplish? They get people on the air. That's, that was kind of the bottom line reason for doing it is to generate activity in New England on the HF bands. Um, we originally thought we might include six and two meters, but there just wasn't any interest. So we dropped that. Um, but basically the idea is for people to learn how to use their station, how well their antennas work, what works, what doesn't. Uh, to learn propagation and learning at operating skills and accuracy. And accuracy means we like to get logs from as many people as possible because we compare them. And if K1KI works K1BG, um, Bruce um, might make a mistake. He might copy my call wrong. He might copy my county wrong. So we check to see how accurate the uh, uh, any station's log is that is submitted. And we take we, we take off a contact if, if it's not correct with both the uh, station worked and the mode and the band and their county. And the same thing on Bruce's end, if, if, he cop, if he works somebody in California but logs it as Ohio, he's not gonna get credit for it. So there's some competition. The, the, more, um, uh, the more serious operators uh, tend to congregate in the Yankee Clipper Contest Club in New England, but there are a, a number of other clubs that do a lot of contesting and DXing. And, and uh, so there's, all, I'll call it an informal competition because there's no, um, no serious prizes here. You're not, gonna, you're not gonna win a new rig or a thousand dollars if you come in first. Um, but the way the contest is set up, it's not like it takes over all bands and all modes like some of the bigger DX contests do. It, there's room for people with modest stations to get on, make contacts, and, uh, and talk to people. So it's good for beginners, it's good for experts, and uh, it's good for just the interaction and getting to know people that might be across town or across country that might have similar interests. So it's it's low, low paced or slow paced. Uh, you can operate as little or as much time as you like. Um, nobody, uh, and the New England contest, for example, is 20 hours long. It's uh, part of Saturday and part of Sunday. Um, and we encourage clubs to get together and um, submit scores from as many different members uh, as want to participate, and we aggregate those and put together a, a score for each club that submits uh, and more than one, you know, at least one log for the contest. And in the end, we send out uh, plaques to about 45 people, the top scorers in uh, different regions of the country or overseas. Uh, in Massachusetts, there's a top uh, a plaque for the top high power station low power station, QRP station. And then there's some special ones for uh, the best score in uh, Western Mass, uh, which Worcester would count as. Uh, there's one for the for four counties in Western Mass, Hampton, uh, Franklin, Hampshire, and Berkshire. Uh, and there's probably one other I can't even think of. Uh, there's a specialty plaque for, even for the top school club in New England. So, there's some plaques available, they're, they're nice. Uh, we, we, got, we have sponsors for about 45 of them, uh, maybe closer to 50 these days. 
and uh, we send them out uh, right right as the following year's contest uh, um, uh, is, uh, is is has started. And we also send certificates, uh, electronic certificates, to anybody who sends in a log with at least twenty five QSOs. And about three quarters of the people that send in logs uh, do have at least twenty five contacts uh, in New England. So. That's kind of the, the, what the QSOs parties accomplish. It's, you know, as in any contest, it, it's all about your own learning about your station and yourself and improving your own skills. And if you want to, you can compare to other stations that you might, uh, you might know from the club or across town and uh, you might, you know, bet a pizza on it or something like that between the two of you or three of you in the, in the club. So, let me go on to the next one here. QSO parties, the very first one I could find uh, was in 1957, uh, before, I was, before I was licensed, but uh, that one started in 1957 in Pennsylvania. Uh, there actually was a New, York, a New England contest in the 1960s, uh, but it was very different than the current one. And that lasted with, uh, I think four or five years and then went away. Uh, when I was in high school, my call was WB6KIL. Um, and uh, a friend and I decided that it was fun to operate in the Pennsylvania contest. And there were a couple of others at that point. How come there isn't one in California? I was living in Southern California uh, when I got my license in, uh, in a seventh grade science class. And there's a group of us that, that got licensed. And, uh, a friend of mine and I started the contest, uh, sent the info into QST, and the following, I don't know what time of year it was, October, I think, um, the California QSO party started, and it kept going for several years while we were in high school, and then we each went off uh, in different directions. I went off to college. He went off to, uh, I'm not even sure where he went off to, uh, but in any case, He's up in Oregon now. Oh, I know what it was. His father ran an electronics store. So he started working there um, or continued working there. So we started it. We had a good time. And then we turned it over to uh, somebody else after we left the area and left school. Um, and then that finally ended up in the hands of the Northern California Contest Club, who runs it today. And they've been running it for you know 30 or 40 years now, since uh, probably the 90s. Uh, or earlier, 80s even. Um, the, uh, uh, so it's continued and it's one of the biggest, if not the biggest in the, in the country. They, they're very good at getting all the California counties on. The Florida contest was started in 1998 by the uh, Florida contest group. Uh, that was initiated by uh, Dan K1TO, who used to live in Connecticut and some of you may have run into when he lived here in uh, high school and a couple years after before he moved to Florida. Um, but they were so successful, I looked around and said, hey, New England, if they had one, um, it might be a lot of fun because if we got all the states involved, we could generate enough activity that it would be even fun for me. I guess I'll say it that way and not, you know, not just 20 stations to work, but maybe a couple hundred. Um, in, in 2006, the seventh call area liked the New England contest so much, they started their own for the seventh call area. Oh, and by the way, they put it on the same weekend. Um, so that means when you're operating in the New England contest, there's a lot of W7 stations on, and it's pretty easy to work all the, all the states uh, in the seventh call area, and some of them are pretty, pretty hard to, to reach otherwise. Um, our, our rules are similar, but not the same. Theirs is only on Saturday, um, and it doesn't quite match the hours that the New England contest runs. Uh, but those are the four biggest ones today. There's a lot of smaller ones. Uh, in fact, in the last few years, there's been a, a competition set up um, by a group called the uh, Oh, what's the, what's the word for it? It's a competition of QSO party uh, competitions where they encourage everybody to operate in everybody else's QSO party. So that's a whole nother dimension of it. So 
The simple answer to what, what makes it successful, a lot of activity in the target area with stations on the air, the number of counties active and the bands and modes that are on the air. Number of logs submitted after the contest uh, makes it e easier to uh, judge who, who the winners are um, and accurately show who they were. And we really want everybody who operates to come back next year. We, we want them to have a good time, even if it's even if they operate for 30 minutes or an hour, uh, or they operate the whole 20 hours in New England. Uh, we want them to come away uh, from that experience happy with it. Uh, maybe they work some new states or new counties or uh, or whatever. Um, and there's there's a bunch of people that go out mobile and put the rarest counties on. And there's also a lot a lot of people these days that do. Uh, parks on the air and uh, other kinds of things like that, that do it on QSO party weekends because they know they can work a lot of people. So there's a lot of that kind of activity as well. So you may, this may be a little bit more difficult to see. I just put in a map of the New England counties. Um, uh, uh, and and uh, like I said, the ones in Northern New England are pretty tough once you get past uh, 200 miles of the mass border, things get a little bit sparse in both Maine and New Hampshire. Uh, and, and a lot of Vermont is fairly sparsely populated. Um, and uh, I mentioned that we might see nine counties in Connecticut next year. Uh, Connecticut has not had county government for 30 years. Uh, every, every spot in Connecticut was, is within a town boundary, but there's no state government. I mean, uh, no, no county government. Um, so we have state government and we have local government. And then there are also a bunch of different planning regional government agencies in Connecticut. And what the state finally did after 30 years of having no counties is they um, sent a request off to the census, US Census Bureau or, uh, and basically said, uh, look, we don't have counties anymore. We have planning regions. So would you substitute those for our counties? So next year, we're gonna have a bunch of different names for those counties, which were counties, those planning areas, but we'll count them as counties uh, and they'll cover slightly different boundaries. So they don't always stay the same. Uh, so this year, um, the. Uh, this year that we're reporting on the 2022 contest, which was last May, uh, we had 871 logs, 295 from New England. And you can see um, the break that we had 295 logs, but there were roughly 961 stations active because that's all the different call signs we saw from people's, uh, from all of the logs that were submitted. And here's the breakdown by state. Uh, Massachusetts had the most, Connecticut second, New Hampshire not too far behind. And then you can see that Rhode Island and Vermont had the fewest. Um, all those people combined of the logs that we received, there were 123,000 contacts made. Um, and, that, um, and that means those are the contacts that we verified by matching logs to make sure that they are accurate. Um, that's a lot. I mean, so there's really a lot of activity on the air during the contest. Um, we had 12 different, whoops, I skipped too fast there. How, we had 12 different mobiles in New England. All the counties were active. Um, here are the four hardest one, or five hardest ones, two in Maine and three in Vermont, all in the mostly Northern parts. Uh, Somerset County, Maine, for some reason, the mobiles didn't get there. Uh, and uh, there was only one person that was on and he, he made less than 10 contacts uh, according to the logs that we received. So getting all 67 was really not possible uh, this, this last year. New England stations made 80,000 of the contacts. Uh, people outside of New England made 40,000. Uh, like I said, we sent certificates to uh, anybody making 25, or more contacts, uh, plaques sent out to a bunch. And we had some participation from, um, from, from your club. Um, 
the one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. There's 11 on the list there. I know uh, Don KK1X is there. Bruce has been on most years. Skip has been on quite a few years. Uh, W1PJE was on last year. Um, and I recognize most of the other call signs. I don't know if you're at the meeting there or not. Um, but your participation has gone anywhere from one or two logs to as many as I think eight, two or three years ago. So uh, really support, uh, appreciate the support of the club. We encourage every club to aim to get five stations, uh, five club members to get on during the contest and send in a log. So uh, if I could give a challenge to you, that would be find five people to get on and have some fun, find 10 people and have even more fun. Um, contest logging software varies all over the place from personal preference and, and so on. In many ways, the contest logging software has I'll call it thinned out in recent years. Um, there are two, maybe three uh, contest logging software products that are, that are out there uh, and in most use. The most popular one is by uh, N1MM, Nancy One Mike Mike, who uh, uh, lives in Connecticut and uh, has a team of developers um, in, across the country and overseas that work on that software. Um, and it's in several different languages and you name it. It's a fairly complicated piece of software. Um, I would not recommend it for a, big, a beginner. Um, you can use it as a beginner, um, but it, it's not, oh, I, how do I say this? It's, it, it probably isn't the right one to use the first time. I'll just say it that way. Um, but it does everything. I mean, it does everything. Anything, anything anybody can think of for improvements, they pass on to them and they mostly add them to the kinds of things that it can do. So it's, very adaptable, works for almost any contest you can think of. And, and it even has a facility to create your own contest module uh, and, uh, and make it available. The second most popular one is by a guy in uh, Pennsylvania, N3FJP, November 3, Fox, Japan, Papa. That's commonly used by beginning and middle level contesters, but it's also used by a whole lot of groups on field day because it's a much simpler program to use. It's easy to set up um, and it's easy when it's easier when you have a bunch of people operating that have a varying um, skill set. Uh, particularly it's good for uh, um, a uh, um, you know, one of the one of the, one of the field day stations for beginners, uh, you know, very good for the go to station. Um, in in the logs last year, we had twenty eight other different programs that were used, um, and uh, there there's a couple specialty ones. Uh, one for the uh, for for the Macintosh environment for uh, uh, for Apple products. It's called Skookum Logger. S K O O K U M uh, by K one G Q, uh, who's up in New Hampshire. Funny, funny thing. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of New England people involved in logging programs, and part of that is because one of the first logging programs was developed by somebody who lives in uh, in Eastern Mass. Uh, it was a program called CT, uh, short for contest. Uh, anyhow, so that's the logging software. And, uh, um, and the last thing I'll say is, I hope a bunch of you will get on this year. Um, and I hope you'll set a target for the club of five to 10 entries. Um, again, it's a lot of fun. In the next week or so, I'll be sending out reminders to a whole bunch of people to, uh, from that, the people that sent in logs last year and the year before. I'll be sending uh, something out to the club as well. And if you could spread it within the club website and email mailing list or otherwise uh, to others, that'd be great. 
Uh, and I also um, send it out to anybody that sent in a log uh, from outside of New England to get them on again. Oh yeah, by the way, the person that won that had the biggest score overall last year um, was in, he, uh, he finished second the year before uh, last year and, and second the year before that. Uh, this year he came in first. And it's really interesting because most of the time the scores come from, I'll say 250 to, to 1500 miles away from here. Cause that's kind of the skip zone on 20 and 40 meters most of the time. And so people too close to New England don't work as many stations cause their signals skip over. And if they're too far from New England, they don't have long enough propagation to New England. So what, what we've seen in the past is stations in Florida and Georgia in the W4 call area do extremely well. In fact, for 18 or 19 years, the winner was a guy in Georgia um, who always did incredibly well. Well, the guy that won last year who came in second the two years before that is from Slovakia. Um, OM2 Victor Lima. And if you think it's hard to work New England from Maryland or Chicago, think about it if you're 3,000 or 4,000 kilometers or miles or whatever it is away. Um, he is incredibly focused on working in the weak signals. He follows the mobiles. He gets on sideband and works a lot of people. And that's you know, the, the more the more you work New England stations, you realize there's a, a limit on the number of CW stations. But there's, I won't say an endless pit, but a, lar a much larger number of stations on sideband to work. And now there's some on, on that, that they can also work on digital modes. Um, the problem with digital modes is you have to use a mode where you can copy the other stations QTH number one, and, and uh, just saying it's in a grid square of so-and-so is not good enough. We need to know the state or province. And if stations you work in New England, you need to, you need to record the state and the county. So if, if you can do it with, your, with a digital mode, fine, that's great. FT8 does not do that easily. And and it's not kosher to go look it up in the call book or, or, or online to, to find out um, where, the, where the person lived. So, the, so anyhow, I just want to say that you can do really well from a, a long ways away, um, but you get too far away and you don't work very many. Um, we almost always get a, an entry from Japan and for the last 10 years, the most QSOs anybody from Japan has had has been two or three. Uh, with 15 and 10 meters likely to be pretty good this year and in the next several years, um, I expect a lot more activity on, on, on those two bands and a lot more DX available. So anyhow, I've, I've exhausted my stay. Bruce hasn't given me the hook. Um, I'd be glad to answer any questions and uh, Appreciate you listening to me. Do you have any questions? Uh, well, first of all, I just have a and I, I couldn't hear anything. Pick up. Uh, Tom, can you hear me? Uh, can you hear me? Barely. Barely. Is this better here? Yep. Okay, Tom, hi, it's, it's Bill, K1NS. And uh, last year, I think I wrote you and said I was going to plan on being on the air, and then I didn't. And the reason was I didn't know how to set up my FTA for the contest. <laughs> is, is there, can you put some suggestions or guidelines someplace posted on the internet so we know how to set up our digital modes? Yeah, well, part of the problem there is I'm not a digital mode operator. I'm an old guy and I don't, it's not my thing. Um, I don't, I know some people who do, I'll see what I can put together because that, that has been a limitation. The, the problem is, I think you have to put it 
you might have to put your QTH in your CQ. Uh, and I think there's a limit on, I might even be a, a limit of, well, I don't know. I don't know the answer. Uh, let me see if I can find out. I, I agree that's a shortcoming and I ought to take the time to document that a little bit better. So thank you for the suggestion, really. Thanks. Thank you. Anybody else? What's the date? Tom, what's the date? How important is that? Why does that matter? Um, <laughs> May 6th and 7th. It's uh, first weekend of May every, uh, every year. Uh, starts uh, starts on, on Saturday afternoon at 4 uh, and goes till 2 a.m. And the reason we start at 4 on Saturday is it used to conflict with uh, uh, the Deerfield Ham Fest. Uh, it doesn't, it's not going to this year. I think there's one, one week later this year because uh, of their own scheduling issues. But it starts at 4, goes till 2 a.m., and then it starts again at 9 a.m. on Sunday and goes till 8 p.m. So, um, uh, or is it 7 p.m.? Maybe it's 7. Um, yeah, it's like 10 hours one day and, 12, uh, and 10 the, and each day it's 10 hours, I think. So get on either day as much as you can. Love to work you. And particularly the people out of state would love to work you. Um, if you go to the website, which is NEQP, New England QSO Party, uh, .org, um, there's a whole lot of information about the different counties and how many people are on from each of them each year, uh, how many contacts were made, uh, hints on operating and on software, um, and uh, a good, a decent write up about how people did in each area. Um, a bunch of pictures get added. The article for 2022 is not completely finished. It'll be up there in a couple of days, but the uh, scores are there and uh, a couple of other things are there. But take a look. And uh, again, I hope you'll, uh, uh, you'll all uh, take a taste, even if it's for 10 minutes, see what you like. Wow. Oh, and if you hear me, give me a call. Yeah. The Got another question coming up here. Don't fail yet. Hi, Tom. Um, seems one thing that might help boost participation would be a little uh, cheat sheet on how to set up N1MM for the contest. I'm yep. familiar with the program and you know, used it in other contests, but it's kind of a perennial hurdle to get over sometimes. It seems yeah. Bruce has offered to coach. Uh, people on, on setting it up, and I've bothered him a couple of times on on that. So it's pretty just, easy. You just really select the New England Piso Party, and that's it. And then one MM. Yeah, that's yeah. really about all you need to do. But but so, it isn't it isn't actually all that simple for somebody that's never seen it, because there is also a Nebraska QSO party, NEQP, that took place last weekend. So some people get confused and look that one. The New England one is N E W E, is this is the the name that you have to select. Oh, yeah. um, and by the way, there are also like I said, there's this uh, QSO party for the seventh uh, call area called the Seven QP, uh, and there's also one from Indiana and one from Delaware, on at some point during during that weekend, using the one called N E W E. You can log stations from any of those QSO parties and send a copy of your log to any of them uh, and they'll, they'll accept it uh, and they'll just use the contacts that are uh, relevant for their QSO party. Um, there's also a, mo a module called IN7QPNE, which is for stations not in any of the target areas so they can operate and workstations in any of the QSO parties. So that's why it can be a little confusing. In New England, you want to use NEWE -E, uh, and uh, not pick Nebraska. And the uh, one that does multiple QSO parties is for people outside of New England, even though NEWE -E can be used um, by you in New England to do them. 
I should mention N1MM is free software. Uh, it's incredibly well supported. N3FJP has got a bunch of pieces of his software. One is just a module for the New England contest and one does a whole bunch of them. In his price, he, he, it, it costs something, but it's a modest price. Um, and the Skookum Auger one for the, uh, uh, for Apple is, I think, a free one also. So uh, again, Bruce, I think Bruce has used all of them, all of them, or if you want to shoot me an email um, mm -hmm. at the address on the website, I'll be glad to help you offline, not a problem. Quick question, does N3FJP do rig control, I would think? Uh, yes, yeah. Good. And the Thank other you. one, all three of them do. Thank you. Yeah. And 3FJP may not do every QRP rig out there, but all the majors are there. And N1MM does an impressive array of almost everything. If your rig can be controlled by, by a computer. Any other questions? Okay, Tom, we're gonna to pull the plug. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Appreciate uh, this. Nice talking to you. I think the last time I was there, I was running for director and uh, we you had all three of the candidates there that night, which was kind of a fun time. I, I, I appreciated it. Thank you again and have a good evening. All right. <laughs>